I'm Brian Norcross. Luke Doris is on weather duty again today, but he'll be back on the podcast soon. This is podcast number seven of Hurricane Season 2020 and number 45 in our series. Today, we're honored to have Dr. Louis Uccellini, the director of the National Weather Service, here on the podcast. Louis also has a title within NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, of course. He's the assistant administrator for weather services. In this very complicated time that we're living through right now, we're all really lucky to have somebody like Louis with this incredible breadth of experience and depth of understanding of so many parts of the weather enterprise, the weather systems, the uh, meteorology, and the mechanics. Uh, it's, uh, it's really a great thing because this is a system that cannot fail. It has to work every day. The National Weather Service has to be there whether there's a pandemic or not. We'll talk to Louie about all of that here in just a moment. We're recording this podcast on Monday, August 10th, 2020. If you're listening at some point in the future, you've got to tune into Channel 10 in South Florida for Local 10 News or on Local10.com. You can always watch Local 10 News live for free if you don't have access to television or download the Max Tracker Hurricane app or the Local 10 Weather Authority app for current weather information. Right now in the tropics, we're kind of in a pause. Every season has these. I can remember when we used to sit around and wonder, how is it that there was just one storm after another for a while, and then bang, nothing happens for a couple weeks? Well, now we kind of have an idea of why sometimes the Atlantic goes dead. And it's, uh, we think, related to two waves that travel around the planet, around the uh, equatorial regions of the planet that affects the tropics. The faster one of the two waves is called a Kelvin wave, the slower one, the Madden-Julian oscillation. And it causes an oscillation in whether thunderstorms develop in the tropics or not. When the positive phase goes by, you get more. When the negative phase goes by, you get fewer. And since Isaesis happened, we've been in a general negative phase of these, both of these sorts of uh, waves. But the thinking is that that will switch the last half of August, where, of course, normally the tropics gets busier anyway. And there's been a lot of dry air across all of the subtropical and the tropical Atlantic, which has tended to keep things under control. Well, that dry air normally fades out in the middle of August, so we'll see uh, what happens this year because that's uh, getting very close. Here we are on the 10th of August. Now, last week, NOAA and the National Weather Service uh, came out with their updated hurricane season forecast, which I'm sure you heard about. It lined up pretty well with the Colorado State forecast that came out the day before, and they were both through the roof uh, up into the uh, low to mid-20s, depending on exactly where how you take their range. NOAA comes out with a range, and that's obviously uh, worrying to everybody in the hurricane zone. As we discussed with uh, Dr. Phil Klotzbach a couple weeks ago here on the podcast, the factors we normally look at to determine whether a hurricane season is going to be busy or not, well, they're all pointing toward a busier season. The Atlantic water temperature is not off the charts like it was in 2005, but it's warm. El Nino in the Pacific, which normally would reduce hurricane activity, is not present. We're trending toward the opposite, which is a La Nina. And generally, the atmosphere overall, in terms of the upper level winds and the pressure distribution in the Atlantic, generally support hurricanes based on the factors that we know. Now, sometimes Mother Nature surprises us, but uh, we can't count on it. Bottom line is we have to. Uh, we just have to be all be ready for the fact that this may be a very busy hurricane season. Maybe. We don't know. But we still have to be ready. So one of the issues that came up and just got a lot of play in this last week is that NOAA is forecasting up to 24 storms, but the list of names only has 21 because the World Meteorological Organization, of which the National Weather Service uh, or the National Hurricane Center is a lead agency, uh, only uses 21 of the letters. They skip Q, U, X, Y, and Z. They don't try and come up with names 
for that. And then if we run out of those names like we did in 2005, they use the Greek letters, alpha, beta, gamma, so forth and so on. And the question arose in 2005, and it arose again when this whole discussion started, what would happen if you had to retire a storm name, but it was a Greek letter? You know, the Greek alphabet has been around for more than 3,000 years, so it doesn't hardly seem right to go around retiring Greek letters. And uh, we talked about this, as I said, in 2005. So, so the thinking is that the best idea would be to create an extra overflow list of names that would get used only if the first 21 get used up in any uh, one year, but that would have to be done by the World Meteorological, um, the WMO, World Meteorological Organization, and it's not really the National Weather Service, but uh, it's going to be interesting to see this year if that the discussion comes around again. Anyway, bottom line, got to be prepared no matter how many storms we have. So let's bring in Dr. Louis Cellini. Louis has published over 70 peer-reviewed articles or chapters and books on almost every aspect of weather. In the Northeast U.S., he's best known for a book he published in 2004, along with another winter weather expert, Paul Cosen, that proposed a, a scale called the Northeast Snowfall Impact Scale to rank snowstorms in kind of a meaningful way. Well, it's kind of like the Saffir-Simpson scale of snowstorms, where they go from notable to extreme in five different levels. And I think that's where I first became aware of Louis uh, because of that snow scale. But mostly for the last couple of decades or more, Louis has been known in the weather community as an administrator directing and planning the science, technology, and operations supporting essentially all of the National Weather Service. He's, he's been the director for the past seven or eight years, and I could go on and on of all the things that Louis has done. But suffice it to say that Louis has been one of the most consequential people in building up the National Weather Service and the Weather Ready Nation program and supporting the entire weather enterprise, which is the media and the private companies and the people that make the apps and, and uh, all of us that, uh, that rely on the tools of the National Weather Service to cover and forecast the weather, the things that we do every day. So uh, let's bring in Dr. Louis Uccellini. I talked to him just a few minutes ago via Skype. Hi, Louis. Welcome to the podcast. It's an honor to have you with us. Well, thank you, Brian, and thank you for having me. I'm really interested in your path from a research meteorologist to an administrator, and we have so much going on right now. Uh, let's start with that, and then we'll come back. You and Dr. Jerry Bell just rolled out the updated seasonal forecast from NOAA last week with the biggest numbers in any forecast like that that uh, have ever been put out. And I know you've been involved in your career with lots of big forecasts that you know, seem potentially monumental if they actually come to fruition. When the team came to you and said, these are the numbers we're going to forecast, what were your thoughts? Does it kind of take your breath away or you just go, okay, here we go. we got to be ready. Well, after uh, the numbers we had in 2005, you know, that was, which uh, I remember, I think the max number we had at that point was, um, either 19 or maybe near 20 or whatever, but not the, the number we got. It went way beyond, you know, yeah, what we expected yeah. for, yeah, for any, any season. Uh, I wasn't in, in, in shock that they came up with larger numbers than we had uh, projected in May. Uh, and getting up to, uh, as part of the range, and remember, we are talking about a range right. here, mm -hmm. um, that to get that up into the mid-20s, um, was something we paid attention to, but uh, one of my uh, uh, going in principles in, in the management job within the weather service, uh, even at when I came into the meteorological operation division in the late 80s, that um, I the, the forecasters are the experts on the table, and if they're bringing something to you and they're defending it, and it makes physical sense, the science is behind it, um, I rely on their judgment. And uh, this was this was no different. Jerry is an expert, mm -hmm. very passionate about the seasonal forecast, and uh, bringing all the tools that we have that we can bring to the seasonal forecast now, uh, both from a statistical and a modeling perspective, running the uh, the climate models out 
time, the, the extended forecast models. Um, I felt very, I have a, a degree of confidence about these numbers, and it, and it is a range that we're, um, that we're pointing to. And, um, uh, you know, I, didn't, I did not challenge him. Yeah. And, and uh, Dr. Bell is retiring after this year. He's been really a tremendous asset, uh, I know, to your team and the team at NOAA. So let's talk about uh, COVID for a minute. Um, has it affected National Weather Service operations, and how is it going to affect the hurricane season? Well, in the, um, in the larger sense of things, you know, we, we always uh, would like to talk about how, uh, from a dedication perspective, it's, uh, it's a mission first, people always, right? right? Because we do have this incredible workforce um, that we've had historically that's dedicated to this mission of, uh, of saving lives and property. I mean, uh, any time we get evaluated by an outside uh, either research group or like McKinsey, you know, consulting mm -hmm. firm, yeah. they're astounded by the numbers they come up with in terms of commitment, dedication to mission, and commitment to public mm -hmm. service. And um, we certainly live that. When you get into a situation where your workforce is at risk because of a national emergency, normally we make predictions to protect other people, right? We're, we feel secure in our in our physical self with respect to uh, what we're predicting. Uh, but now everybody's, you know, affected by this, in, 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 including and especially our workforce, because even though we've been able to, uh, you know, decentralize ourselves, you know, and, and work from home, like in, in this kind of a situation, and even do that with people from our forecast office, there's a, there's a component of the forecast process you need people in that office. So in that larger context, we went into the planning purposes with two fundamental aspects, actually. It, it became uh, uh, people first, mission always, not mission first, people. We reversed it. Uh, conceptually, mm -hmm. we reversed that. We, we were very concerned about the safety of our workforce and maintaining uh, their health and welfare uh, so they could actually uh, conduct the mission. Right? Because if everybody gets sick, then you, you know you, you, you lose that mission. So right. that was clearly uh, an important thing that happened to us as a management team. Secondly, uh, we now have in this new structure we have within the weather service and the way we plan and operate our budget. We had a, a new position that we put in in 2014 as part of our uh, you know uh, recovery from the uh, financial uh, mishaps we had in the early part of this decade. Uh, we um, created a chief operation officer, mm -hmm. and that chief operation officer was co in contact with the field continuously and allowing the plans for how we were going to operate to come from the bottom up, you know, from the, f the field offices, from the regions, from NSEP, mm -hmm. uh, not a top-down thing. We were very, and it's incredible, uh, we could build off of, we, we practiced this our backup plans and our continuity of operations. We, we really have plans for backup and continuity of operations for every forecast office. We practice it, mm -hmm. but now it was different. Like, even that had to be different. So plans came in on, for example, how many people you really need in the office? How many? How, some of this work can be done outside the office. Yeah, like Bring every company in. in America, right? Or every company in the right, world, actually, right? right? Right, but what what data sets are you know really you're not they're right in there with the AWIP system that you gotta be there to have that at your fingertips. How right. many people do you need? And how do you keep them socially separated? How do you conduct a shift change? Right? right. Normally you have a half hour overlap, and you have the people talking to each other. So now we do that remotely. The new shift comes up, sits in their car, they get the shift brief from inside out. The the people who are on shift go out, you know, one door. The other people come in the other door. So there's no interaction because we want to keep a separation, really, yeah. you know, through the, through the shift schedule. I mean, it was just a, a, the way uh, you surge during during extreme events, including hurricanes, was reviewed. If changes are made, you know, how do you follow the social media? Can you follow from surrounding offices? You know, so all of this came to play. And um, we've done remarkably well we you know we've, we've we've had some cases of COVID-19 uh but we've done remarkably well um 
and everybody's fine. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, it's great. Uh, is your plan the, uh, still evolving? You know, do you do you, you kind of change it no, as you go here as the situation yeah, is well, evolving? You go through the point there is it, it's always evolving because certain parts of the country are more severely hit than others, yeah. and you have different stages of re. You know, people are. Also, we're also now trying to manage the reintegration and, you know, in the early part of this, this national emergency, for example, the northeast part of the country was severely hit mm -hmm. um, and uh, less so in the rest of the country. Now you got the south and southwest parts of the rural areas are being harder mm -hmm. hit now than they were in the first wave. So we're always tracking from, again, a local um, medical report. We're using the numbers that we get from those officials, local to state to federal, so that we uh, can conduct our uh, reintegration steps, again, from a local perspective, mm -hmm. okay? So yes, uh, it's uh, John Murphy is the chief operating officer who's on the phone with the field every day, you know? And, and, and of course, when we have these big events coming in, uh, we make sure that we're plugged into the way the emergency management community has to adjust and how they're going to adjust to evacuations for hurricanes, for example. We have to adjust to their plans as well. We have to communicate to them uh, in the way they need it because they're adjusting their plans as as we move through these events. So, so it's been really, it's actually been amazing to watch and be part of uh, and to see how these uh, plans evolve. But you got to go back up to that fundamental change we made up for up front. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, people, people first. first yeah. yeah. Right? And, and, um, and it's all then managed from that bottom up perspective uh, to get us through this uh, crisis. So, Louis, it seems like you've gone down kind of two paths simultaneously in your career you know, meteorological research on one hand and management on the other. When you were studying meteorology, getting your PhD in Madison uh, at the University of Wisconsin, did you have in mind at that time managing key parts of, of the National Weather Service and now running the agency, or did it just evolve? Uh, I would say it just evolved, uh, in all honesty. It, it is, and it's also in everybody's career, there's a capriciousness, a unique, somebody influence you in a certain way. Uh, builds up your confidence in a certain way, uh, and you go down that path. I, when I entered the University of Wisconsin, I entered it with a simple, you know, fact. I always wanted to be a meteorologist, mm -hmm. right? As far back as I can remember, my, my parents told stories that even as I was learning to talk, I was pointing to clouds and getting excited about a snowflake that went by the car or something. You know, I was just, you know, I was always interested in meteorology. Mm -hmm. I wanted to learn about meteorology. When I went to the University of Wisconsin, uh, Vern Sumi was just spinning up the that's a, People were saying, hey, you got to go to Wisconsin. There's a satellite. This guy, Vern Sumi, has got the future of meteorology coming out of Wisconsin right. with the satellite program. So I went there uh, with the idea that, that was I in the 60s, right? That he was yeah, there. Uh, in late 60s. Late, late 60s. Right. You know? and, then, and, and then I got all my degrees from 71 on, right? Mm -hmm. Right. But it's. Um, yeah, you know, I wanted to learn. That's what I, that's what excited me. And then I got confidence instilled by me by Holly Anderson, my master's degree advisor, and then, and then Don Johnson, who was my PhD advisor. Mm -hmm. And I felt developed this confidence in research during that period. I when I when Charlie Anderson said, uh, you know, what are you going to do when I was coming out of my junior year, and I indicated that oh, maybe I'll go into the weather service and become a forecaster. He said. No, you won't. You're going to graduate school. And don't apply anyplace <laughs> else. That's when I honestly thought, oh, he has confidence in me doing the research. Um, and I uh, I took that on. And I, I treated that, as, a, as again, as a learning experience for me. I, I loved it. I was learning something new every day. And I, and I carried that with me no matter what I've done in meteorology. I want to learn something new every day. That's one of my goals. So uh, it's it's been that learning aspect that's been constant and then that's gone into the different parts of my career in different ways well anybody that knows you and, and works with you and, and pretty much everybody in the weather enterprise uh is aware of you and has interacted with you in some fashion would say that you're having fun are you having fun i enjoy i've enjoyed every job i've had mm -hmm. and i enjoy this job yeah. i I've, i feel like uh 
we're succeeding in what we've uh, laid out as a plan back in the early part of uh, two ten, actually 2010 to 2012. I uh, laid out as a plan and then grabbed that plan, basically that strategic plan of building a weather ready nation as a foundation for uh, moving the weather service forward. And it's been fun. It's, you know, one of the knacks I've had is I allow people to join up and, you know, be part, be not only a part of it, but, you know, take leadership roles mm -hmm. in it. You know, it's got to be, you got to have everybody kind of working this. Um, and it's and it's worked. And I, I enjoy doing it. Uh, yeah. It's part of the management. Yeah. It shows. <laughs> yeah. It shows. So. And, you know, I mean, you and I are about the same age. And it's great when I see somebody in, at, uh, at our point still with a spring in their step. And so it's, it's, uh, it's a great thing. So you grew up on Long Island, New York, at a time when hurricanes seemed to like uh, Long Island and, and the Northeast in the 50s. I was in New Jersey at the time and, and remember some of them, but Long Island certainly got more with Carol and all the 54 and 55 hurricanes, not to mention Donna in 1960. Did they affect you? Did, did you have an affection for uh, tropical meteorology as a result of living in that place and time? Well, I, I, you know, all truth, you know, I was just excited about snow. <laughs> yeah. right? The tropical storms, I still remember vaguely. I couldn't mm -hmm. tell you which one was which. Mm -hmm. uh, but they actually scared me. You know, there was the heavy rain. There was um, very strong winds. And uh, I remember there was one of them where it was just my younger brother and me and my mother at home. I don't, I think my older brothers were at school. And the storm came on and my father wasn't home. And it was, it was a nerve wracking experience. I always thought of this as being afraid, but Don or I was older. Mm -hmm. And that made landfall. We, you know, it's just waking up in the morning again. It tells you something about the forecast because the night before it was like, "Hey, we're going to school tomorrow," and no notion about school being canceled. You wake up, and the first thing your parents tell you is that school's closed because this hurricane's coming up. And the only time I remember really seeing the full damage of a hurricane was on TV with all the buildings destroyed. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and um, so I was I was nervous about it, to tell you the truth, and. Uh, excited as it was happening, but my parent, my father, would not let us near the windows or the door. We got hit pretty hard by Donna. Donna yeah, came pretty close to making landfall right over our hometown. Yeah, just and, missed the uh, end of Long Island. It was right at the end of Long Island. With the center, it was a big storm. Yeah. though. it was a big. It was a big storm. Big storm yeah. And I remember, I remember actually how intense the one. We had pear trees that that uh, we didn't pick the pears until September. Mm -hmm. uh, it was one of these late, late pairs, and um, every pair was stripped off the tree. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it was just, just amazing. Uh, and uh, very heavy rains, flooding rains. Uh, you know, the, the golf course, Bethpage Golf Course, was uh, just pouring water out off of it. It's, that's the only hilly part mm -hmm. of the island that I, I know of. <laughs> and uh, it was, um, it was uh, really a startling. Uh, experience for me. Very interested in how all that works. Of course, excited about it, mm -hmm. but nervously excited. Mm -hmm. So, and what the interesting thing about '60 and then '61 was also the winter of '60 '61 was probably one of the best winters uh, I remember going through as a kid. And boy, that's what really locked me into meteorology. I would I would have thought you would have remembered the wasn't it Christmas of '64 um, that the, the Christmas snowstorm. I I was flying from. From uh, living in Florida by that time, uh, flew out of Melbourne on an Eastern uh, Electra, you know, uh, prop airplane, going to Philadelphia, and we got diverted to Idlewild, uh, and landed in a freaking blizzard going on at uh, at Idlewild, yeah. and had to take a train. Oh, it was a it was an all day yeah, and December, night ordeal. December of '63 was definitely interesting. And then into '64, that was the January of '64. Well, maybe, well, maybe we was it Christmas of '63? Maybe was the the yeah, big storm, yeah. right? It was. There was a series of some storms that that came up in mm -hmm. that, and you know, in that December time frame. Um, yeah. But there was nothing like '60 60, '61. Yeah. Uh, that 
So, well, yeah, I was uh, I was in New Jersey at the time. Um, <laughs> I'm sure, but and we used to have big snowstorms all the time. I, yep. I'm, yeah, I remember so, remember that well. Like, remember the Kennedy the Kennedy inauguration? Yes, the, right? yeah, freezing uh, cold. Uh, yes, January, right? But right. it was February of '61 that just buried the whole area. It was, and that yeah. was on top of the, all the snow that we had in January because it never really warmed up. And you know, in that part of the country, if you could get one snow on top of another, it was very unusual for that to happen, you know, especially on Long Island. Right. right. And we just we just got buried. I mean, it was just incredible. Yeah. So, <laughs> I know. I love that. But, one. <laughs> but, but, but getting back to the hurricanes and <laughs> in, 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 uh, it. It was something that got my attention, let's put it that way. But it was not the same impact on me as, as, as a snowstorm. It just, so. so the, the, you talked about Donna, the, the fact that you woke up in the morning and they called off school. I mean, this isn't, when you go all the way forward from 1960, Hurricane Donna, to 1992, Hurricane Andrew, uh, I talk about this all the time related to Andrew, that we really didn't at that time expect to have forecasts three, four, five days in advance. You know, so the idea that with Andrew, really the first awareness came late in the day Friday, but really Saturday for a storm that hit Sunday night was the time that people became aware. And then they had all day Sunday to re prepare, and they ended up not preparing well enough because nobody had any idea what was going to happen. But but still, they felt prepared by Sunday night, right? There, nobody was running around. Streets were empty. Everybody was in place. You know, uh, city was calm, waiting for it to happen. But it, it, it occurs to me that because we now give forecasts so far in advance that have, you know, a significant uncertainty, but tremendously less than, than not that many years ago, that people make more complicated plans that take this time, you know? And um, how do you reflect on, on the balance between, you know, t giving people advance warning, uh, and but then they therefore have three-day plans and four-day plans that they need in order to get ready, where <laughs> back in the day we used to have, you know, half-day plans or one-day plans for when a, uh, a disaster would happen? So that's a, you can really unwrap that question in a number of ways. So by 92, by 1992, we had um, a situation that, you know, we, we could predict the hurricane. We could actually observe it better. So our situational right. awareness was definitely better with the geo geostationary satellite, right? I mean, right. Mm -hmm. the... Uh, uh, you know, you, at least you knew it was there. Okay, I mean, back in the '30s, people didn't even have the situ really have the situational awareness right. of of these the, where the storm was, much less what the intensity was. I remember Andrew very well because with that uh, was that '91 or '92? '92. Remember '92, mm -hmm. right? That that um, I was the head of the meteorological operations division. Right, I went all the way from from Goddard Space Flight Center, working under Joanne Simpson, by the way, and knowing really? Bob Simpson really well. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Then going over to the Meteorological Operations Division, we had just instituted a backup plan for the Hurricane Center. And, and, and there were members that actually came from the Hurricane Center that came up to MOD, Meteorological Operations mm -hmm. Division, because there was a concern by Saturday that, that this storm could hit not only Miami, but be focused in South you know, that south part of Miami, right, right. where the hurricane right. is. Right. Oh, so, their forecast 30 hours out had it within a, a few miles, had a perfect forecast. Right. Well, right. Yeah, exactly. 30 hours out. Yeah. Exactly. So we had the backup plan. We had it in place. So they, we came up. Jerry Gerald. Jerry Gerald came, came up. That's right. He was yes. the deputy. Uh -huh. He was mm -hmm. the deputy. Right. And um, so we watched that, and there was a couple of things. One, the track was pretty much in hand okay mm -hmm. people felt like this thing was right. going to come across the intensity was not mm -hmm. remember now it was like it was i think about a category two or three that was sitting to the east as it was coming in from east of miami and what i remember very clearly looking at the radar with jerry gerald mm -hmm. that said because i was we were there the whole sunday sunday night right into mm -hmm. monday and uh of course we had the satellite imagery but we were just implementing the uh the next rads Right. at that point too. and uh, we could tell with, from the next rad that this thing was intensifying 
<laughs> yeah, so <laughs> so you were looking at, at the radar out of Melbourne, right? Out of Melbourne. Because right. did you have access to the Miami radar? We had access to the Miami radar. It wasn't, it wasn't an extra, but you could see right. even with that Miami radar and then with the Melbourne radar, that this was intensifying. Right, right. Well, and, 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 <laughs> I know and, that and well. So, I remember and, that and like it was yesterday. Was how do we update this? Because they, right. they had just given the update, right? And um, as it was coming closer, it was pretty obvious it was intensifying to a four. Mm -hmm. And remember, it took an analysis for, what, one or two years or three years maybe that well, it, it finally got Ten years later, yeah, as, because it was yeah, as a five. Yeah, right, it was the new, GPS yeah. Ropsons that they right. – we right. redid their um, analysis of, of winds at 10,000 feet versus the ground and, and right. use that for the upgrade. Yeah, yeah. So, the, I mean, the, yeah, the technology so by was, 92 so that was, was the better. issue. That yeah. was really a big right. issue was that intensity change, uh, which was the nightmare yeah. scenario, right? The intensity change, right, as it's approaching the coast, right? Right. So that was really the big forecast issue. But the other aspect of this was that we that year was the first year we put the bogus thing in for the center of a hurricane so it would sustain some resemblance of a circulation. In the model, so yeah, in, in, in the main in the model. model. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So what I remember very clearly was people weren't really looking at that as it approached Miami because they didn't what kind of trust do you have in the models? The first time they're actually, it was the eighth storm. Yeah. Well, it was the many? first time that model actually ran. First time that hurricane tracker actually ran in the so-called right. AVN model, the GFS That's today. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so I, 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 I'll tell you. It went, it went through Florida and it got it back into the Gulf. Everybody was looking at that model to see what would happen with New Orleans. Exactly. So, so, that, so that was a transition that was going on too. You know, it was, yeah. it was you know, right there in front of our eyes about, What's the uncertainty of, of this forecast, right? Yeah, so, so anyway. So you'll like this story, Louis. I have a little story about the intensity of Andrew as it's approaching South Florida. You know, it hit eastern Bahamas, it hit Eleuthera, as today we say category five, back then we said category four. And then it, as it was going through the Bahamas, it went through an eyewall replacement cycle. Uh, but very uh, uh, presciently in the uh, discussion, uh, uh, whoever wrote the discussion, it might have been Ed Rappaport, I don't recall, but th they brought up the idea, well, it's going to encounter the Gulf Stream. And so here I'm looking at the radar, along with everybody else, and, and we're seeing it kind of unravel a little bit. The hurricane hunters are showing it getting a little bit weaker, but I did not report that on TV, that it was getting weaker, because... <laughs> Because I didn't want people at that point to say, "Shoot, it's okay. We're going. You know, let's. You know, we can relax." Because if it came back together uh, over the Gulf Stream and reintensified as on the schedule of the eyewall replacement cycle, it seemed like it might, and it ended up doing it. Um, you know, that that we we wanted everybody to assume that this was going to be a worst case situation and act like it was a worst case situation, you know, in terms of their personal preparedness inside their house. Well, well, you obviously couldn't do such a thing today uh, because back then, you know, none of that stuff was on the internet. The information about the, the recon planes was, on, uh, was not available to the general public, wasn't generally reported. So I elected to not talk about that weakening <laughs> cycle uh, just in, you know, under the heading of keeping people maximally prepared. So anyway, an interesting difference between what you could do in 1992 and what you can do today. Yes, and, 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 and you know, even working with the partners today, it's the same. You want to get them the knowledge that they need, mm -hmm. um, not only during the storm, but obviously further and further ahead of the storm. And when you asked the question earlier on about you know, now we're doing it four or five days or six days in advance. No, I didn't anticipate we'd go that far in advance, but it, in working with the emergency management community over the past uh, eight to ten years, it's very it's become very obvious to us and the Weather Service and me personally that the sooner they can get going on something, the better. they got to stay ahead of the storm, number one. And with places like Florida, when you see the the change in the population along the coast and how much longer it's going to take to evacuate and how much more complicated it is to evacuate cities and towns that their evacuation paths overlap with each other. Uh, how, the fact that there are older people living along the coast, mm -hmm. so it takes longer to evacuate them 
everything pushes that decision process out in time, right? When the forecasts are even more uncertain. Exactly. It's a so bad combination. <laughs> it's a bad combination, but yeah. we have to we have to address it. We have right. to embrace it because, you know, like in Irma, six and a half days before landfall, the governor of Florida is declaring a state of emergency. Why? Mm -hmm. Because no matter which side of the peninsula that storm was forecast to come up on, they made a decision that the entire state of Florida was going to be impacted, and they would have to start the evacuation in the Keys earlier. They yeah. basically get that part of the process out of the way in case you had to evacuate Miami. Or, right. you know, it was a very, very uh, complicated uh, decision process, but a very important one in, in a staged sort of way. It put the pressure on us to whatever the uncertainty we felt about the forecast out at days eight, seven, and six, we had to address it with them. They, mm -hmm. they, they needed that information. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, the good thing is, to some degree, in Southeast Florida and in the Keys, it's at least a, a well-rehearsed system. You know, the government yes. there isn't shy about saying, okay, we're closing everything down now, where other governments and other places have different pressures on them, less understanding at the higher levels. But in South Florida, boy, I mean, they, if, if they think there is a threat, they close it down. Nobody's going to work. Nobody's going to school. You know, it is just they're going to shut down the, the systems in the town and and you know to the benefit really and to the credit of the uh, political leadership uh, in South Florida that that they've built a, a credibility enough to say when the National Weather Service says or the Hurricane Center says or emergency management says that we're not taking the chance with with people here right. and, and and they right. have enough credibility to to make the call and and uh, people in general roll with that. Yep. Yeah. No, it's it's and 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 remember I said this learning something new every day, uh, working with the emergency management community at every government level from local, state, tribal nation, federal. You know, I mean the whole the whole dynamic right. is really to get a better understanding of their decision process and their key decision points in that process uh, makes us better at communicating what they need for those key decision points and uh, it, it it's not something that just comes overnight you have to practice with them you have to be mm -hmm. prepared with them and it's working I mean you were, we're seeing it you know working during these more recent storms in, in amazing ways actually yes I know they you had a wonderful um, editorial op-ed in the Baltimore Sun about Isaias the really, you know, making the point that the National Weather Service is functioning well. Not all of government is functioning well, but the National Weather Service, in spite of the pandemic, uh, in spite of the challenges, uh, is is functioning well and and to the benefit of of everybody up the coast because the forecasts were terrific, really terrific. Yeah, and, and he also, uh, as David uh, Zorowick, also emphasized that we communicated with consistency within the entire enterprise, right. all right, which is something we practice within the entire mm -hmm. enterprise now. This 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 steady drumbeat, but consistent. Mm -hmm. He even used the word consistency mm -hmm. in the so that the messages were received and people could make their assessments to prepare, right, with mm -hmm. the emergency management community now in in lockstep with us. And we're in lockstep with them. Uh, to ensure uh, that this message is getting out and, and, and actually driving decisions, whether it's a personal decision based on what they get over their <laughs> cell phone or, you know, local uh, you know, public safety officials making decisions accordingly. And, and he called that out. And that's the difference between, I think, what's happening now uh, with this Weather Ready Nation um, uh, strategic goal that we've, we've adopted and we've actually now included the entire enterprise in um, it really was it's really paying dividends because this consistency as you well know something that you've argued for in past storms mm -hmm. actually you've been more vocal about it than, than many uh, is absolutely essential in, in getting the kind of decisions that you and I want to see as meteorologists right, right. You, and, and you as a communicator you know pride yourself on this uh, 
it's it's really important that we all embrace this and and to be called out in a in a in an edit, op-ed page. I thought was, was well, was I'm sure exciting. I'm sure that made your day. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, it's great when when people <laughs> recognize that, that there's a process yeah. here and the process is not trivial. Uh, during the time that you've been the director at the National Weather Service, operations have changed or the philosophy of forecasting has changed to something you're calling impact-based forecasting and decision support. How is that fundamentally different from the way weather forecasts were uh, communicated really since the beginning of weather forecasts and hurricane forecasts yes. specifically? So, so I think, you know, I, I'll try to put it in general terms, and there's always a lot of detail within this, but fundamentally, uh, uh, I think it's fair to say that a forecaster, whether in a national weather service or maybe even, um, you know, within uh, other public domain space, um, you know, their job is over with the forecast and warning. You, you make the best forecast you get, you issue the warning in a timely way, and you put it out there. And people use it. Mm -hmm. Well, if your forecast and warning isn't, again, connected to what a decision process is, whether it's, you know, within the... Uh, like evacuations you know, the, or whatever the Evacuations, it be. public yeah. safety, energy, right. uh, electrical, maintaining your electrical grid, you know, uh, uh, retail industry, you know, all... Well, so, so from a public safety point of view, this is what the Weather Service then decides to focus on, right? This is mm -hmm. part of our mission statement. But we also provide data to the private sector who serves a larger, a larger space. Mm -hmm. The private sector knew from a customer uh, you know, perspective what to deliver to their customers for satisfaction because they get their direct payments accordingly, right? Mm -hmm. you're, you're tailoring your products for that. For us, from a public safety point of view, there was an assumption made, we do the best we can from a forecast in the morning, put it out there, and right decisions will be made. Well, we, we can show that that isn't the case, right? Especially mm -hmm. with the tornado outbreaks in 2011, stark examples where we think we're communicating well and we're not hitting the mark at all. Mm -hmm. we're not, we don't have a fundamental understanding of the decision process um, within the governments at, at the local state federal level and in this country most of the decisions are made at the local level so right. you've got to handle that whole spectrum right and um, so we took it as part of building a weather ready nation that we had to go beyond our forecast and warning we had to connect with decision making and if this is where the the impact based decision support came from to do that you have to get to know your partners in that you got to you got to be partners with the decision makers mm -hmm. you got to understand their decision process you got to understand their key decision points you got to practice with them years before months before the tabletop exercises the other the other ways of, of interacting with them so that they understand what you can bring to the table and you can understand their needs it's not what happens the day before the event or the week before the event and it's what happened six months before and a year before in terms of gaining their trust with the level of accuracy you can bring to a forecast nobody can give them a perfect forecast and like we just talked about hurricanes now they want to start action six days before landfall right. okay right so so which that is daunting is, <laughs> <You know>. <laughs> yes. um, so that is where we are mm -hmm. right now and why does this make a fundamental change to us because now it's not just the physical science it's the social science mm -hmm. if you're plugging into decision making you got to understand risk and risk preferences and the fact that they change so a risk preference that six days before a hurricane is different than three days before is different the day before, is different during the hurricane itself, right? Mm -hmm. There's a risk preference yeah. that changes. How do you adjust to that with your products and services and communication? You're not going to say take action now at day seven and six and five, right. but it could be at day one or when that eye is about to, you know, I mean, there are different ways that you have to communicate the mm -hmm. threat because now the risk preference has changed. We're just, we're just scratching 
the surface on this. Yeah, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, and so because it's a combination of some situations are really are quite certain, and other situations are quite uncertain. But you still have an event that's going to happen in the same number of days. So uh, something beyond just the pure forecast is called for in any kind of extreme event, really. So let me just let me end this part of it by just saying that one of the things that came across loud clear as we were started our really detailed work with emergency managers across the whole the whole spectrum of, of emergency management that consistency could actually be more important than absolute accuracy mm -hmm. so you know they'd rather have us strive for consistency because if people see that there are different forecasts coming out from different segments of the weather service they'll shop around and they will not you know act if if the uh, enterprise and uh, you know you know me I don't I'm not going to tell a media person what to say or not to say but what you hope for in developing a partnership with the private sector and the media it, it, again there's a trust factor involved um, but there's also a, a, a joint recognized need that if you're saying one thing and a different media outlet saying something else and the weather service is saying three different things from three different offices the people out there who have to make decisions, or even the individuals who are downloading our stuff on their individual phones and then become decision makers for their families, are not going to react the way we want them to. Okay? So it's not a matter of who's right and wrong and who's bringing what to the table. It's, it's, it's though that we have to recognize there's got to be a consistency in the messaging in these extreme events for people to take the right action. Yeah, people and cannot be confused. People will get paralyzed right. with confusion, and that's no good. Right. You know, to your point about consistency being more important than absolute accuracy, I mean, anybody that knows me and has known me for, for some time, I used to have at the bottom of my email, precision is the enemy of accuracy which is the same idea, right? Is that you can be precisely right, but accurately wrong because you have tried to move around your, your precise guess, right? But you're all over the place like this, where down the uh, middle of the road was taken into the same place without the confusion factor of trying to be too precise, right? It's the same okay. idea. So you have to give that range of solutions, be honest about the range. Right. Why some systems are more uncertain than others, in terms of uh, accuracy. Some of these storms behave like Ir uh, Irma. Mm -hmm. It was incredible. You know, seven, eight, nine days in front, right. we're still predicting that turn into Florida. Uh, and I others mean, like Joaquin, you know, that, that yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was either it's either going to London or it's going to North Carolina. That's the saddle point. That, yeah. that you talk about the. Uh, the, uh, the 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 cross of uh, of uncertainty, yeah, you the know. fork in the road. Uh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so uh, for many years before you were the director of the whole National Weather Service, when I first met you, you were director of NSEP, the National Centers for Environmental Prediction. Uh, as part of those responsibilities, you oversaw the Environmental Modeling Center, where we, in, in our country, we run the U.S. GFS model people that that watch the computer models online and where it's actually developed in collaboration with others run on supercomputers. A new version of the GFS was introduced, was it launched last year, right? The, the latest generation, um, yeah. which in some sense is the platform of the future as I understand it. So how's that going? How do you feel about it? And uh, where is American modeling uh, going? And I should just add, go ahead and ask you because it's everybody's thinking it. How does it compare to what the European Center is doing, and how do we work with them? And, and uh, I think everybody acknowledges that they have probably the best, on average, model in the world. Uh, and I know you, know, you guys want to be as good or better. Uh, how do we get there? Yeah, so, so one of the, again, that's a, that's a large question, yeah, a, a yeah. lot of different aspects yeah. to it. So, so let me just start that during my tenure at NSEP, we, uh, you know, we recognize you try to simplify problems as, as much as you can to solve the situation you're in. But there are three fundamental components of a modeling system, right? I mean, and to make a modeling system work. First, you, ha you have to have a global observing network that you can access in real time, assimilate the data, you know, access the information from it that you need 
take advantage of the data's uh, strengths while avoiding their weaknesses, bring that together in a way that your numerical model can then use that data without rejecting it. Right. Which, so that's, you know, so that's essentially then, to have a good right. starting point. This data assimilation right. so is really have to have observing starting data point for the model. And then you got to run the model itself right. at, at the highest possible resolution with the best physics um, to get your forecast. Mm -hmm. So to do that, you have to have your science right, mm -hmm. of the data assimilation and the modeling, and you have to have your computing power. Our biggest, uh, the weakest link in all of this, you only, you know, as strong as your weakest link kind of, kind of argument here, was our computing capacity was woefully underspecified. And we compounded the problem by the breadth of, of our mission, right, from the, from, the, from the sun to the sea. We have space weather all the way to ocean prediction. Uh, from sh very short range, right, uh, hours, minutes to hours, all the way out to seasonal. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have this incredible uh, range in our mission with, with minimal computing power compared to the uh, Europeans. The European Center has one mission. They run one model for medium range prediction, mm -hmm. right, from zero to 10, 14, 16 days, and that, you know, now it's grown out to a month, right? So... But that's a very focused model, run at much higher resolution than we've been able to run our models because we've got everything else we have to do, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and we have to make a forecast. They just give their model output out to other services that then make the forecast. They sell it, so, actually. So, yeah. so we, we were really, uh, I, I knew we were at a disadvantage. But mm -hmm. one of the decisions we made in the early uh, 2000s was to implement ensemble versions of the models across that entire spectrum from short range to the seasonal. So we had we had the uh, SHREF for the short range, we had the, uh, the the GEFS for the medium range, we had the climate forecast system, which was a an ensemble system, and from the TOGA ex not the TOGA experiments the um, uh, Thorpex experiment, we learned that multi-model ensembles were the way to go, right? Right, so, so this is uh, just for, for folks that are, are not yeah. using this stuff every day. The ensembles are taking the same model or version of the same model and running it with slightly different uh, initial conditions, slightly different parameters, and so you get a range of possibilities. Again, it gives you right. an idea of the uncertainty of the situation. Right. So we get 21 mm -hmm. every six hours out to mm -hmm. 16 days from the JAFs. We get 21 in a very short range from the SHREF, we get four from the climate forecast system. But then we, we were able to work with Canada to get uh, another, um, you know, 21 per cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we, uh, uh, so that would be our medium range. And then we had, uh, now we're running multi-model ensembles for the, uh, uh, for the seasonal. We made, that, we made that decision that the ensembles would get better skill out into the extended ranges. And actually, the ensembles have become a basis for these kinds of uncertainties in the forecast track for hurricanes, for example, mm -hmm. that people start looking at the, the spaghetti charts. Remember, you, right. everybody's using those on TV. Right. They come from the ensemble. So we made that decision. What we couldn't fit on the computer was the four-dimensional variational analysis used for data assimilation that the European Center perfected. And it turns out we just... If we had done that, we would have taken our whole computer that we actually had. We wouldn't have been able to do the other things. So we made a decision to go that way. I see. We're now trying to catch up. We have certainly have catching up on our computing capacity, and we just made an announcement that, you know, that by this time next year, uh, we'll be into our next generation computer, which will have, uh, you know, the 12... Uh, Petaflops, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, third, third multi trillion billion you <laughs> yeah, know, know. computations per second. But we'll have those on two different systems, primary and backup, mm -hmm. like we also put in place um, after the turn of the century. And uh, so, you know, we're we so we getting into this next generation model. We said let's do the dynamic core first, then do the physics package on that dynamic core, mm -hmm. and then work with the outside community, including the global community, including the Europeans, the European Center and the UK mm -hmm. Met, are part of our effort to bring us into uh, the 4D VAR world, uh, which is where we look like we're going in our data assimilation. 
um, and, and then bring this together within the next couple of years. But we have to look at each parts of those um, as we bring them on board. But we have the computing capacity now that we didn't have. Uh, mm. Even when I took over in 2013, we were like 200 trillion calculations per second. We were orders of magnitude below what the European Center had for its computing capacity mm. for uh, just running one model, right? Yeah. So, uh, so we're we're also we're uh, as part of this effort today, we're working towards what we call a unified forecast system, so that we don't have all these separate models as we go through the scale. So we'll 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 save on that, and we're doing this in such a way to make it available to the community much more effectively. This open source code that we're working through, uh, which will be the basis for. Uh, Epic, the new uh, framework that uh, uh, Neil Jacobs, uh, acting NOAA administrator, mm -hmm. has been promoting. All of this is, is coming together even as I'm, I'm speaking with you. Uh, more simplified, cleaner version of the model, run more efficiently on bigger computers, uh, open source so we can work with the larger research community to continually improve the model. Uh, all of this is uh, being pulled together now uh, so that we'll be in place in a couple, within a couple of years We'll have all these pieces put together for the uh, new version of the GFS. Yeah, just to put a bow on that that data assimilation thing, because that's not that's not a normal word that a lot of folks are familiar with. But but I, I recall a research project that took the European models data assimilation and then ran the GFS with that data and ended up with forecasts as good as the uh, European forecasts in the end. That kind of proved the fact that. Uh, the, the data assimilation part, the part where you take all the observations all over the world and put them in some kind of order that the model can then work with Digest. is such right. a, such a uh, key component. Of course, the Europeans and the, the Brits and everybody else in the world, the Germans and, and everybody else are moving ahead with their models too. It's not, nothing is stagnant in this. Uh, that's, that's right. But, it, so but what, good, what got in our way of actually mm -hmm. grabbing that because some of our people actually worked on on their systems and they're working with us on our systems right now so we have this collaboration going mm -hmm. on but what got in our way was the lack of the computing power and and like i said we made we made a conscious decision to go with the ensemble approach and then be able to come back to the data assimilation and that's what we're doing now yeah all right well right. and we use the ensembles i mean just constantly obviously you can't do hurricane forecasts in the modern world without all versions of ensembles. Right, uh, right. Just on a completely uh, maybe off the wall, but do you see a day coming? I mean, as these computer forecasts are getting better and better, and I know at the local forecast offices they depend more and more on the computer forecast, but do you see a day coming where the computers make the weather forecasts and the humans just handle the communications? Well, um, you know, it's interesting. I, I uh, I know there are people out there who feel like we can automate now, right? Mm -hmm. And yet I see a, the, the, when you're tracking the weather every day, and we do, you know, whether it's the chief operation officer or, or the deputy of the weather service or me or, you know, there's another whole group of, uh, of the weather uh, service under this um, ocean of program planning and service delivery. We're, we're all tracking this every day, mm -hmm. all right? And there are certain systems that are more predictable than others. Mm -hmm. We have... Uh, you know, hurricanes, like I mentioned, Irma, the predictability was, mm -hmm. you know, six days in advance. I mean, there was there was so much consistency from day nine to day six as we approached the event that the governor of Florida declared a state of emergency. Mm -hmm. I can guarantee you we're all holding the table at that time because <laughs> we all know that predictions can fall off that table, right, right. Um, as you approach an event and a different, a different scenario emerges. Uh, I've seen some cases where literally the predictability at day one was a major problem. I'm talking like snowstorms. Uh, oh, I believe know, me. Severe weather outbreaks. I and have and even in, in a way, some of these hurricanes. And it's like, you know, if you were to automate that system mm -hmm. at day six, five, four, three, two, one, it would have been all over the place. And what was the steady, what was the steady forecast that was coming out? In the hurricane, it was the Hurricane Center. There were, the collection of the collaboration uh, within the Weather Service is giving it. You, you get a more consistent, you know, even if you have to alter, you get a, a consistent way of doing that. And it's not about like that windshield wiper effect that you want to avoid. Right. I still see that occasionally, right? 
And I don't want the forecasters to lose their sense of a situational awareness, not only in terms of what's happening now, but why are we saying this is going to happen day one, day two, day three, day four, away from now, right? Mm -hmm. you, you, you better be all over those models. You better be understanding, uh, you know, hey, you know, the predictability for this case hasn't, hasn't been behaving too well. We've been all over the place from day eight to day four. And let's hope it settles down between day four and day one because there's some key decisions being made. We still have that. We still have those issues to deal with. So it, it might be that you can centralize some of this. You can automate some of this. You can use AI and artificial intelligence to extract useful information more effectively and, and alert you to scenarios that you might not have been thinking about, right? Uh, but there's still a level of uncertainty that you're going to have to deal with and communicate, and you're not going to be able to do that by just ripping and reading. Uh, it's, it's going to have to take a concerted you know, focus on, on what's happening as we're approaching an event to be able to make that communication such that the folks who are using it to make life-saving decisions are trusting what you're doing. Yeah, I don't think there's and, any and question. I don't think there's any question that, that humans are needed for communications. I, I don't see in our lifetime, certainly, that computers are going to communicate with humans better than humans do. I guess the question is whether uh, the, the consensus models uh, are becoming so good. I mean, the Hurricane Center really relies on them for generally for their forecast, but not 100% of the time, but generally, whether more of that can be put on the computer. But I'm sure people ask you, Louis, because the big boy, do they ask me and everybody else in my business, they ask, what's the best model? What model do you look at? Right? And I say, yeah. I look at the National Hurricane Center model, <laughs> their, their <laughs> forecast, right? Just If you just quit looking at all those models and look at their forecast, you're not going to go wrong. You're not ever going to win by looking at a model. And I know there's a lot of a big effort at the Hurricane Center to show that by showing that in so-and-so storm, the European model was better. In so-and-so, the GFS model was better, the US model. Another one, the UK MET model, who had the best uh, average errors and so forth. And that's the nature of it, and that's why you average all these together and you end yeah. up and with some, with a, a better This is a really, better this, this is a really important point because the, um, you know, we all want to have the best models. Right. There's, there's no question about it. We bring the best science, and uh, but you know we have relationships uh, around the world in the meteorological community that goes back to World War, post World War II. It was sort of like a meteorological Camelot that brought us the numerical capability around the globe. Right. Mm -hmm. One of the things we do uh, within that community, that international community, is we share. So we, our forecasters have access to all the models you just mentioned, right? And they use them, mm -hmm. all right. And and they'll tell you un, under certain circumstances, uh, you know, they 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 like the European model, and certain certain circumstances they like the Canadian model, they like the UK, they like mm -hmm. they like our model. Uh, we just make sure they get all the model output to work with, and we have post processing systems now, which are statistically. Uh, tune to when the models perform the best, and and they got access to that as well. It's this yeah. national blend of models, right? Um, so uh, we want to make sure we have the best information to assist the forecaster to get them beyond the forecast. Remember, we talked about that earlier. The, the job is changing. It's it's now they're going beyond the forecast and warning to provide the information for decision makers. You know that's been your career on the media. Mm -hmm. You've got to communicate. You've got to go beyond the forecast and warning. You got to communicate. Ours is, um, you know, we're we're new at this, right? Mm -hmm. uh, over the last ten years, and uh, but it, it became certainly apparent to us uh, from storms early in this uh, the past decade that uh, we had to go. We had to do things differently. We had to simplify our messaging, and we had to account for the changing risk preference as as we were approaching a system. Uh, we had to, we have to do this, and this became the basis of this, you know, this strategic goal that we've set for ourselves and been working on for the last eight years. So you ever see all kinds of programs and initiatives, and the National Weather Service has a roadmap that I know you and your team have put together of the future. But 
will people notice in the future? Uh, in, uh, are there programs coming along or steps coming along that people are going to notice, the average person is going to notice, of how the National Weather Service is going to serve the public in different ways? Or are the changes that you see coming in the future kind of incremental to the services that you are, are you know, offering today? Or my point is, is there some kind of thing that's coming that you think will elevate things to a noticeably higher plane? Yeah, so um, I, what, why we use the word evolve, mm -hmm. you know, we're evolving the National Weather Service because we don't view this as a light switch kind of thing, which is why we were so excited about that op-ed page that <laughs> you know, somebody noticed that you know, we're working to, you know, to keep our messaging consistent and serve decision processes. This is, a, this is a big deal. But right now, the most important aspect of this is to ensure that our core partners, you know, the emergency management community, the water resource management community, our partners in the media, right? Uh, we, we're, we now have you more involved with us in, our, in the pre-release of our products through these chat sessions. You tell us why you, you think, hey, you, got, you should be expanding the warning process mm -hmm. or, or, you know, how come you're not covering these three counts? Not, maybe not you personally, but people in the media actually, you know, we, we debate, you know, we, we get, you know, preliminary products out there so you can see what we're doing. Oh, yeah, we, we get know. surveyed to death now. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. So, so the thing is, but even in real time, you know, mm -hmm, yeah. people, we got, you know, hundreds of people in these chat sessions right. that have to now go on on TV or serve a, 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 a blog or, mm -hmm. or you know, deal with the emergency management community that's trying to decide whether they're going to evacuate the south side of town, the west side of town, you know. I mean, all of these kinds of decisions are being made aware, we're be, being made aware of even as we're developing our products and services so that we can work together to get towards a common uh, a common, uh, you know, solution set that people feel comfortable communicating to, mm -hmm. um, and I think I know the emergency management community is recognizing it because their accolades, both at meteorology conferences and emergency management conferences, about how we've revolutionized them in terms of proactively now being ready for an event rather than just reacting to the event once it starts, has been astounding, and it's happened faster than I thought it was going to. Tell you the truth, I thought it would take much longer to get to where we are today. But people are recognizing it, and that serves well for us because uh, our workforce is embracing it. And the new people coming in to the weather service from the universities and you know private sector people have applied. You know, there's a flow through of people mm -hmm. back and forth. They're all embracing this. Yeah, I think uh, they, that I think that's a tribute to the the need, yeah. the vacuum that was there that that uh, right. is being filled. You know, last week when Isaias was going up the Florida coast, in fact, we were talking about it on the podcast last week uh, that you know, any time a storm is parallel to the coast, a slight deviation makes a tremendous difference in the weather right at the coastline, right? right. And it was it turned out it was a wobble that ECS made to the right away from the Florida coast that kept it off the coast. And I made the point that that was really unforecastable. The forecast was an excellent forecast uh, because it was, you know, it ended up being 20 or 30 miles off the coast and the bad weather was on the right side of the storm. So it was over the Bahamas. Essentially random factors are in play meteorologically that make a storm wobble that, that we're never going to be able to forecast, I don't think. So do you think that, well, first of all, I know research shows there is some limit to forecastability. How close do you think we are to, um, as a former modeling guy and a researcher, to uh, some kind of forecastability limit in some aspects of the forecasts uh, that we make these days? Well. Well, I know the theoretical studies had a limit of predictability of about 14 days. Mm -hmm. You know, um, those those studies were based on um, you know not having any external forcing. So, you know, everything was based on well, what happens within the atmosphere, mm -hmm. right? Right. So, what are we doing today? Part of the revolution in modeling, by the way, is not just going to an ensemble type system, but we now are embracing the entire Earth system science domain right so you have the atmosphere you have the ocean 
you have the land, hydrology, you have the cryosphere. All of these are brought together at the same time. And it, you know, the goal is to get them. That's the next part of the change is to have a fully coupled system that works together as you go forward in time. Well, the predictability of that kind of a system is really not known yet. There's, there is uh, evidence to suggest that once you put those boundary conditions in um, to the atmosphere, you can actually extend the limit of predictability. If you use ensembles versus just a single forecast, the one run of the day, you add one or two days to the limit of, of predictive skill, right? Mm-hmm. So, so the, you know, there's an activity now that's actually being organized through OSTP, um, Office of Science, Technology, and Policy for the, for the, for the uh, White House, uh, Kelvin Drogemeyer, well-known meteorologist mm-hmm. who we've all worked with during our careers, uh, to not only study I- improving prediction, but a better understanding of predictability uh, for these systems. So I don't know. I don't know how far we'll be able to push the envelope. I do know we have to go further for water prediction and water resource management. They want predictions out months to seasons in advance, and for water planning purposes, decades in advance. Okay, yeah. so that's a whole different. Well, that's a whole different kind of kind of, kind of thing than right. than right. you know situations where the chaoticness, right. intrinsic chaoticness of uh, ah. like the, like that makes a wobble in a storm that has everything to do with whether Palm Beach gets the hurricane or it wobbles to Fort Lauderdale or it goes it misses the coast you know that's a different kind of a predictability barrier uh, right but, but think about this water resource people or agricultural groups they yes they want their daily precipitation forecasts and all that but they also really need to know what's going to happen a month in advance right, right. so they're putting they're putting like 30 days that's why we're expanding our ensembles out to 31 days yeah. a, a water resource manager needs uh, three or four weeks to really do something that would change perhaps how they would manage the reservoirs and 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 their whole water system uh, ice forecast up in the Arctic you know daily forecasts are are important but a 30-day forecast is really important for when it's going to freeze up or break up right uh, kind of thing all of these are putting challenges on our predictive needs okay and and also puts challenges on us to articulate what is the predictability out in those time frames because we haven't worked this yet through the fully coupled systems that we need to run. You can't do an ice forecast in the Arctic without having the cryosphere linked to the atmosphere and the oceans, right? Right. So, so it's this is this is a really big challenge, is opportunity, and for those scientists now coming into the field, knock themselves out because this is going to be career kind of work that's going to need to be done to really address uh, not only the issues and the uncertainties but the opportunities uh, from the improved predictions we're going to get from these uh, types of the type of work doing today or at least the type of work we're doing to lay the foundation for those kind of models that's happening right now yeah so i i I think that this whole issue of just uh, fundamental predictability or forecastability of a certain scenario is an area that that is a new kind of forecasting if we knew that that would be uh interesting information and 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 I know I'm looking forward to, to research on that. Louis, I, I, I got to let you go, but I, I just want to ask you because last February was the 150th anniversary of the legislation that began the organized American Weather Service. It's evolved unbelievably over the years, of course. But reflect on, on that moment and the changes uh, and what it's like to be the guy that's kicking off the next 150 years. Yeah, well... Uh, first of all, uh, we had we, we, we spun up this heritage program within the Weather Service, but also shared it with the entire enterprise because of what we were discovering about our own history. Right. So 150 years ago, it started uh, right in the late 1860s and was actually created. The Signal Service was created in 1870. So how? Mm-hmm. Why? Why then? Well, you had a telegraph network, mm-hmm. and the government was establishing forts for the West, you know, so you could get data for the West, and with the telegraph network and the data, you, if you could move that in real time, right, you could 
you could come up with indications of what was going to happen tomorrow because you were tracking this thing coming from west to east. And the idea certainly was uh, came upon the, the scientists at the time who were working on this, more natural scientists, uh, that, hey, you know, we might be able to predict what's going to happen tomorrow, right? So that started you know, with, it. With the emphasis on might. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, yeah, but yeah, you know, yeah. when they were right with the squalls, what, what drove it basically right. was the transport ag- across the Great Lakes. Uh, people, a lot of ships were going down to Lake Michigan, people mm-hmm. losing their lives. So this was a really important thing to try. Mm-hmm. So that was, you know, that was a really an amazing thing. What was also amazing to realize was that there was a discussion between uh, Increase Lapham was the chap from Wisconsin who promoted, first promoted the use of this data for actually making a forecast back in 1858, 1859, working with yeah. Henry from the Smithsonian, mm-hmm. who was collecting the data for climate work. Uh, when Abby uh, came around and was being uh, supported by the Cleveland Chamber of Commerce, he actually they actually had discussions. We found some original source material about private versus public sector in the 1860s. They were having these discussions. Really? Wow! I didn't I know that. The public and private thing started after <laughs> World War II. You yeah. Know? Yeah. So when I so when we 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 uh, like we uh, presented this to the uh, our partners meeting. I saw a lot of folks from the private sector saying, "Hey, we ought to be doing a historical <laughs> review of of our uh, background as well, because it does trace back." The other thing we've learned is the transformation uh, to uh, from the signal service in the army to the Department of Agriculture, so it became a civilian organization mm-hmm. in uh, eighteen ninety. Which was essentially uh, came out of the 1888 New York blizzard, isn't it? Wasn't that yeah, a, a, a New York blizzard facilitating? And the, children's blizzard, the children's blizzard in the Midwest both happened in 1888. Right. And really tremendous forecast bus. You know, yeah. hundreds of people losing their lives. There was, a, you know, more interest, there was more interest in science in the Department of Agriculture uh, than, you know, in the Army, and, you know, using this data from a science point of view. So there was a drive to get it into a civilian. It was 1891 um, or 1890 or in that time frame. Mm-hmm. The uh, so we went into the agriculture, and then the other, and then there were that so big snowstorms did that in the 1930s. The big hurricanes right. drove, and and the increase in aviation interest mm-hmm. uh, drove uh, us to the Department of Commerce. Yeah, the 1935 uh, with, uh, Keys hurricane was yeah, key the in that. Yeah, the 1938 right, New England, exactly. Long Island, right. New England. Right. Uh, so all pointed to major changes. So so you see this need for major changes after some big events and forecast challenges. And it takes decades, really, to address the observational infrastructure, uh, like the radio star network went mm-hmm. in after World War II, radars after World right. War II. Uh, numerical modeling started after World War II. Uh, the, the satellites, all this stuff came in, and we had a modernization with NextRad radars, automatic surface observing systems in the 80s and 90s. But we found that wasn't enough with the big storms in 2011. Mm-hmm. So now we have the Weather Ready Nation, right? right? I mean, you see these big events, um, you know, sort of driving fundamental changes. Yeah, catalyzing uh, events, you know, they call them, yes. Catalyzing, right, yeah. right. It's just just amazing to see that. And I think we're living during one of those periods right now mm-hmm. uh, with this weather rating nation goal that we have set for ourselves and for the enterprise. And, and, and now that's been embraced by the folks that are actually making decisions, you know, on the ground, which is an emergency management community throughout government, I think this is uh, really a... This has really been an exciting time for us. Yeah, when you, you start something big and you you know you see fruit finally being born on the tree, it's uh, it, it's a good uh, feeling. It's a great feeling. So, Lloyd, it's been a pleasure having you on with us. I follow you on Twitter, so I know how busy a guy you are, and really appreciate your taking the time. Well, thank you for having me and having us. I uh, I, uh, I I know that. Um, it's people like you out there in the in the media and and in the larger, uh, I would call social social sphere, you know, of, of the uh, of our digital world, uh, that it's really important uh, that you uh, you continue to work with us, uh, keep us uh, keep us moving forward, and uh, I just want you to know that we really appreciate right, it. So and, thank you. and we move forward together. Thanks, Louis. Thanks so much. It's really important, I think, that everybody understands that none of the information on the apps and the websites, none of it would be possible without the people and machines and hard work 
of the National Weather Service. That can get lost in the glitz of the graphics and the apps and the updates and everything else. With the reality of how budgets get drawn in the, this country and maybe elsewhere in the world, we should remind the politicians of that as well. We're here in August, and this hurricane season is, of course, just about to get started in terms of the busy part of the season. So when we talk to you next, uh, in theory, we'll be either in that or closer to that. And on the podcast next week, we're going to talk with Eric J. Dolan, who just released a book called A Furious Sky, The 500-Year History of America's Hurricanes. It's not just a hurricane book for weather weenies who love to know the details of every storm story. It's a great story book. The stories in it are really fantastic. You understand how different and complex and intricate and random each storm is. I totally recommend the book, and I look forward to next week's podcast with author Eric J. Dolan. That's our podcast for this week. Thanks to Louis Uccellini for being with us and being such a good sport. For Luke Doris, I'm Brian Norcross. Have a good week. Stay safe, everybody, and please wear a mask. <laughs>